So thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Anisha Sharma, and I'm the Education Manager at Clear NC, Clean Air NC, and um, we are so happy to have you here with us. So starting in late 2022, we at Clean Air announced the launch of this book club to promote education and conversations surrounding climate and environmental justice issues. Our first pick um, was this book, Wastelands, The True Story of Farm Country on Trial. And we happen to have today with us the author, Corbin Addison. So I will go ahead and share a summary um, it's a book that eloquently ties together the transformation of NC's agricultural economy from being mainly tobacco to hog production. It's a story of how just a few men gained power in the industry and transformed it from family farms into contract farmers for a multinational corporation. And the stories of black farmers and those with historical and familial connections to the land were faced with unbearable smells and deleterious health impacts of being exposed to these facilities and the spraying of hog waste. Um, all while highlighting the narratives, perspectives, and experiences of plaintiffs, lawyers, community members who were engaged in the nuisance suit against Smithfield Group. So with that being said, we are so fortunate to have Corbin with us here today to answer some questions regarding his work and the issues discussed in Wasteland. So I, I will go ahead and introduce him. It is my honor to do so. Um, Corbin Addison is the international bestselling author of four novels, A Walk Across the Sun, The Garden of Burning Sand, The Tears of Dark Water, which won the inaugural Wilbur Smith Adventure Writing Prize and The Harvest of Thorns, and one work of narrative nonfiction, Wastelands, The True Story of Farm Country on Trial. His books have been published in more than 25 countries and address some of today's most pressing issues of justice and human rights. He holds a law degree from the University of Virginia and an engineering degree from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. After completing a judicial clerkship, he spent six years trying cases in the courtroom before turning to writing full time. He's a supporter of numerous humanitarian causes, including the abolition of modern slavery, forced labor, and gender based violence. He lives with his wife and children in Virginia. We're truly so fortunate to have you with us today, Corbin. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. Sure, it's my pleasure. Uh, yeah, so I think with that, we can dive into our Q&A session. Um, I have a couple of pre-prepared questions, and then we'll be happy to take questions from our attendees as well. Um, so I've spotlighted you as a speaker, so hopefully everyone can see you as you're speaking. Um, and the only thing I would request from our audience members is that when you wish to ask a question, if you could utilize the hand raise feature or raise hand feature um, on Zoom so we can see that you have a question and then we'll do our best to honor the order in which hands are raised just to make sure that everyone gets their questions answered. Um, so thanks for your cooperation in advance. And I encourage any and all questions because if you're thinking it, the odds are someone else may be thinking the same question so we can all benefit from hearing it. Um, with that being said, I'll jump into asking my questions and y'all just feel free to raise your hands and we'll let you jump in. So Corbin, my first question uh, to get us rolling and our juices flowing um, is for those of us who may be joining today who haven't yet had the opportunity to read the book or are unfamiliar with the issues of CAFOs in Eastern North Carolina that were discussed in Wastelands, um, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind setting the scene for us and providing some context and background. Yeah, so um, I had never actually been to Eastern North Carolina before I had occasion to go down there to do research on this book. Um, I honestly just driven through or down the I-95 corridor. I live in Virginia. And, and so we ne never really had been east of I-95 except to the Outer Banks. Um, there's a whole world uh, in between I-95 and the coast. And, and it's a world that, frankly, even a lot of North Carolinians I've come to realize uh, don't know much about. It's, it is the old tobacco country, the world that King Tobacco built. And in about the 1950s and 60s, uh, the economy changed. A lot of tobacco farmers were struggling to keep uh, their family farms. And in stepped uh, a young man at that point, Wendell Murphy, who had an idea to turn the hog industry, which had basically always been ancestrally just you know small herds of uh, of you know uh, hogs being raised for uh, for pork um, tenderloin for you know breakfast bacon holiday ham 
uh, on the ground in people's backyards, uh, you know, and, and he did the same thing. Um, and into a huge industrialized uh, system. And, and the idea that he had really was to do for, for pigs what Don Tyson had already done 20 years before uh, with the chicken industry. So supersize it, you know, <laughs> Americans love to supersize things. So that's what Wendell Murphy proceeded to do. And, and he basically was able to, to hand out contracts to a lot of these tobacco farmers um, saying, look, you know, if, if you'll take my pigs, if I, if I give you some pigs to raise and you raise them for, you know, the five months it takes from their weaned date to the point where I can sell them to the slaughterhouse, I'll give you a dollar. This is in the late 1960s. I'll give you a dollar per head. And that was, you know, if you could turn over three uh, lots of, of hogs in a year, you know, for some farmers, that was, you know, 15, 20,000 extra dollars, all for just keeping hogs, keeping them alive. Um, you know, Wendell said, it, you know, we'll, we'll provide the feed, we'll provide the medicine, uh, we'll pick them up, we'll, uh, we'll drop them off. All you have to do is keep them alive. That seemed like a great deal for a lot of tobacco farmers. And, you know, it was at the beginning. The challenge, of course, is that, you know, Wendell, he was a classic American entrepreneur um, and, and frankly, supersizing the hog industry at the same time, many others were supersizing other industries. So his, his vision was, look, I mean, how can I make the most, the most money possible for myself and maybe, you know, for the farmers, if, if that works out for me. And, and so he decided to put, you know, the, take the hogs out uh, of the pens, put them inside barns that he invented. Uh, they, these would be climate controlled barns. It would basically be self-supporting. The farmers wouldn't have to do much. The hogs would never see the sunlight. They would be trucked in and, and they would be fed from, you know, these mechanized little, um, almost like nipples that come, you know, they're, but they're metal and they, they kind of hang down. The hogs can get their water, get their feed. Um, and, you know, they'll just grow naturally so long as uh, there isn't some bacteria or, or virus that gets into the herd. And then, you know, uh, five months later, we'll pick them up, take them to the slaughterhouse. So that's kind of the way that the CAFO industry, again, when I say CAFO, that's a concentrated animal feeding operation. It's just an acronym to shorten that. It's, it's basically an industrial hog farm. So you've got now uh, in Eastern North Carolina, you've got something like 9 million hogs uh, centered mostly in, in four counties, uh, Duplin County being the, the densest, uh, 2 million hogs uh, in just that one county alone, that's 35 animals per human being. And, uh, and a lot of these farms have, you know, upwards somewhere between five and, and 15,000 animals um, in the barns. So, you know, from the outside looking in, from, you know, above looking down, you don't see the animals. Uh, you really tend not to hear them either. Um, I mean, certainly the farms are tucked away back in the the folds of the land, uh, very close to waterways um, and forests. They, they did a good job hiding what, what they're doing uh, and, and making it not visible from the street. You can see it all if you go up in a small airplane, which I've done, it's kind of amazing. But you know, you can imagine the challenge of a uh, waste disposal. So you know, it's an unpleasant reality, but hogs, in order to produce you know, the bacon that uh, most Americans love, uh, hogs produce five times the waste of human beings. So if you have, you know, a barn full of a thousand hogs, that's uh, the waste of a, a town of 5,000 humans. If you have, uh, you know, a farm with 10,000 hogs, suddenly you're dealing with, you know, the, the waste every day of a town or a city of 50,000 people. And, and the challenge is that, uh, you know, Wendell Murphy and his buddies uh, that built the industry were never willing and still to this day are not willing to pay for uh, waste treatment, the way that we, you know, human beings have civilized our own waste treatment over the years. We used to use open sewers. We used to use cesspools. And there are places in the world that still do, but most places don't because it's very unpleasant and it's not good for the environment and it's not good for the health of the people nearby. Uh, the same is true with hog waste. In fact, hog waste is even worse than human waste when it comes to, you know, airborne pathogens and uh, the diseases they create. So, um, you know, Wendell Murphy and, and his buddies who built the industry, they basically, you know, just used the old cesspool system. They just dug big holes in the ground, 
uh, next to these barns and flushed all waste from the animals out into the holes that are open to the air, open to the hurricanes, the rain. Um, and then when the, the cesspools, what they call lagoons, got filled up, they basically just hooked up these giant Jurassic sized spray guns, uh, you know, to the, uh, the cesspools and sprayed all of that waste up, up into the air and out into these fields. Um, a lot of the, these are fallow fields are not being used to cultivate anything. It's mostly plowed dirt, might be growing wildflowers. It, the, the folks it really in Eastern North Carolina connected to the tobacco industry considered this their salvation. Um, a lot of the folks that are connected to the economy down there consider it the greatest gift uh, you know, that's ever happened to that area um, since the end of tobacco's reign. But there's a group of people um, that were never asked uh, for their opinion uh, and, and who have suffered greatly. And those are the, the neighbors of these hog operations. So it turns out that uh, the industry put most of these CAFOs in areas uh, that are dominated by um, lower income, black and brown uh, North Carolinians, mostly black folks who mm -hmm. trace their ancestry on the land, in many cases back you know, 50, 100, 150 years. Some of mm -hmm. the stories from Eastern North Carolina that I put in the book are really profound. I mean, of these, these folks who live today on the land that their great grandfathers or grandfathers acquired after being emancipated from slavery, and this land is their heritage. It's the most important thing to them after their families. They have no interest in leaving. I mean, these communities have been around a long time. They're very tightly knit. And, and for them, it's an outdoor community. It's a rural community. Their churches are nearby. They have, you know, before the hog industry started despoiling their land and water and air, you know, they would do everything outside. The birthday parties, weddings, funerals, uh, church gatherings, potlucks. And, you know, and then these giant spray guns went in and started spraying this hog waste uh, up into the air around their homes and in their neighborhoods. And you can imagine what happened. I mean, not only was it unbelievably, I mean, really unbearably awful to smell, um, but it started causing all sorts of health effects, especially lung issues like asthma, uh, hypertension, heart issues, depression, mood, mood disorders. Um, for a long time, nobody wanted to talk about it. And these folks were people who didn't have a lot of political clout, um, you know, for obvious reasons, being poor and black in the South. Uh, even in the 1980s and 90s, they, they still didn't have, did not have much in the way of political clout. Um, they tried to raise what awareness they could uh, in Raleigh among the politicians, but nobody wanted to, to deal with it. Even those who tried and, you know, within the political sphere got shut down by the industry until mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that um, a couple of hog farms or hog farmers wanted to build in the backyard of Pinehurst, which is uh, one of America's iconic golf resorts and oh. a place that, uh, you know, the folks in Raleigh, the Poobahs and Politicos really cared about. So suddenly they were willing to say, all right, well, we will basically draw a line in the sand, no more lagoons and spray fields going forward. But, you know, they weren't willing to touch the ones that were already there. And by that point, there were more than 2,000 hog farms, industrial hog farms across eastern North Carolina. So unfortunately, you know, at this point, those, those farms are still there. Um, it really took an enterprising group of lawyers, uh, you know, to actually step up in 2013, take these claims. I mean, this is, you're talking about a generation of trying to fight back without success. And finally, these lawyers stepped up and were able to bring, you know, suit against Smithfield. Took seven years. It was, uh, it was quite a war and got a lot of press, uh, generated a firestorm and a backlash from the industry and frankly, from a lot of the folks down east connected to the industry. And I, I realize I've given you a very long <laughs> answer to your initial question, but I figured I'd just sort of set the scene and then we can go from there. I think that was perfect. Thank you so much for um, that incredible response. Um, I'm happy to continue asking my questions, but I'd also like to open to floor, open the floor to those who may have some prepared questions. Um, so feel free to raise your hands if anybody does. Um, but my next one, I guess, was um, 
this book was created out of hundreds of hours of personal interviews. Um, and I think you did an incredible job of weaving together individual moments from the lives of these community members, from their perspectives and people who are engaged in the lawsuit. Could you explain what that process was like for collecting those stories and where you kind of started with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, you know, all of my books I, have required a lot of research, even my novels. I mean, I, I'm somebody who wants to live the story before I tell it, um, whether it's, you know, going to be a fictional narrative that I create based on, you know, lots of interviews or a, a true story. So I just spent a lot of time, you know, in and around the communities down east. I spent a, a ton of time with the lawyers and their, uh, their staff members. I mean, I went to Raleigh and spent time with legislators went up in the air, uh, you know, with Rick Dove, who was supposed to be on a waterkeeper, uh, you know, in the Waterkeepers Alliance, where it was very supportive of my research. A number of NGOs were, um, you know, I basically went wherever the story had gone. And by that point, thankfully, uh, I mean, there had been four federal trials. There were five in total. I was able to go to the courtroom and see some of the fifth trial. And then, you know, at that point, I was embedded really within the the community of plaintiffs and plaintiffs' lawyers, uh, you know, through the end of of the appeals pro the appeals process, which took about another year and a half. So it was um, it was definitely an extensive experience mm -hmm. um, and one that you know basically I was on the road for six months uh, of the year for the first year that I was working on it, um, in which is I had kids, uh, you know, and my wife at home, and you know she's often done the single uh, parent thing when I've been away, um, but this time was actually more extensive than any other, other book that I'd ever written, because I, I knew that it needed to be right. I also knew that the industry would be paying very close attention to what I wrote, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't get sued. So you know, I need to make sure that everything I did would be bulletproof, uh, accurate, and, and frankly, you know, I knew from from the get go that writing a book about the hog industry, uh, <laughs> specifically about um, hog waste, was going to be a heavy lift uh, to get anybody to read it. I mean, it's just not a subject that automatically triggers a "oh yeah, I want to read <laughs> put that on my <laughs> nightstand" uh, kind of response. So you know, thankfully, because I'm a lawyer by by training, um, I practiced before I, I started writing full time. Um, you know, I knew that I could create a drama around the, the litigation. Um, the deeper I, I, I looked at the story, the more I realized that it was really an untold civil rights story. And, and I, you know, back when I was a college student, I read a civil action by Jonathan Haar, which was another great true story of a big courtroom uh, lawsuit. And, and I realized that, you know, that was actually an inspiration for me to go to law school. I thought, if Jonathan Haar could write a book that felt like a novel, um, I'm a novelist, I can do the same with this story. So that was my goal from the beginning is to write a book that would be as compelling to read as a novel, but would be 100% true. And, and again, <laughs> uh, ultimately pass muster with the lawyers for the industry um, so that I wouldn't you know, get tagged with a lawsuit. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. I see two questions that were posted in the chat. Uh, Terry, if you'd like to, if you're able to have access to the mic and would like to share them, you're welcome to. Okay. Well, first, I want to say how much I enjoyed this book. Um, you're a great <laughs> writer, and um, you told the story in a way that made it very, very understandable to non-legal people and, um, and totally engaging. Um, but at the end of the book, I had these two questions. One is, has the have the plaintiffs received their payouts? Sure. Um, yes. I mean, I I uh, have never seen a check, uh, nor could I. Um, that's one of the the you know the unfortunate thing about a settlement like this is typically big settlements are um, confidential. Uh, they are only not confidential when you deal with uh, public entities. So, you know, there's no uh, Freedom of Information Act request that could um, get into, you know, the details of the settlement. So the, the lawyers, while they were incredibly open about sharing their lives with me, their families, uh, their homes, I mean, and, you know, and of course, all the, the plaintiffs as well. Um, I've never been able to, you know, figure out how much the, the uh, settlement was, but I, I do know that they received what payments uh, were due to them. 
And um, I don't, you know, again, I don't know the amounts, but I, I know that just knowing Mike and Mona um, and knowing the number of plaintiffs and the, and also the jury verdicts, I, I'm sure it was a very substantial settlement and it helped uh, a lot of people do things that they really needed to do, um, fix up their houses. You know, a lot of these folks uh, have never been able to send their kids to college. Um, that's something I, I would imagine that some of them will be doing with what they got. Um, you know, I know that that Mike and Mona really wanted to see the industry change and the industry did change some things, some of the smaller things. Um, and frankly, it'd take too long to get into the details of, of that. But the, the big thing that the industry simply refuses to change, notwithstanding many, many years of admitting and knowing that it's a problem, is the legacy lagoon and spray field system. So that's, you know, that would take a few hundred million dollars uh, for them to, you know, replace that with um, with some form of, you know, decent civilized uh, waste management. The technology is there. Um, it's been studied by the state. They just refuse to pay for it. They'd much rather send the money to their investors uh, or reinvest it in the business than, you know, deal with all this sludge and, and gross stuff that they're, you know, pumping out into the, the atmosphere and which ultimately gets into the soil, gets into the rivers and streams. We know all of this. It's uh, it's just one of those things that nobody wants to look at. So here, you know, and this is sort of an aside, but I um, in Charlottesville, Virginia, you know, I went to UVA law school. We're big UVA uh, basketball fans. And I was at a game not long ago, and I see this at the, at, in the football games too. Smithfield is a uh, Virginia company and, and they are a huge sponsor of UVA. And so, you know, every single time I, I go, I step foot in the UVA football or basketball arena, what I, I, I see ads for Smithfield bacon. And, and it's fascinating because, you know, even the students, they'll wear these like these bacon heads, you know, uh, oh, that I would imagine Smithfield is handed out. And I just yeah. want to reach, I just want to, you know, get them all in a room and say, do you know how that bacon gets made? I know. Uh, you know, it, it's a fascinating reality, right? Most people, and this is true for all of us, with, with all the things that we buy, that we wear, that we use in the world, for the most part, we have no idea where they come from. We have no idea what goes into them, how much, uh, you know, human and environmental abuse is, you know, stitched into our clothing or is in the food that we're eating. And we wouldn't know that because the companies don't want us to know that. And, and that's why, you know, for, for such a long time, you know, the industry has been so good at keeping this hidden, keeping it under wraps. The nuisance suits really kind of broke it open and forced people to pay attention for the first time. But even, even with the nuisance suits, you know, Smithfield can spend some millions to get nice advertising at UVA sporting events. And most people still don't know. <laughs> so I'm hoping, uh, you know, it, we're, we're in talks with some folks in Hollywood about, uh, you know, bringing this to the screen and it, it's, it, yeah. it's a story that's made for it, I think. And um, my hope is that we'll be successful and maybe we'll reach a broader audience with that. Yeah, uh, can I, I hate to tell you this, but um, this is the, the things that Smithfielders doing is the same way that human waste is treated. Um, they're all treated in lagoons. Um, some of them are covered, some of them are not, but they're all sprayed on farm fields. Um, and I think somebody referenced sludge diet. Um, and there's been lawsuits uh, against North Carolina for that too, um, huh. but they haven't gone as far. So you might want to check and yeah, see how I, your I, local I, water and sewer authority works. Yeah. And, yeah. And to add to that, uh, Corbin, and I didn't catch the name of the woman speaking, but the Environmental Working Group also has a, a comprehensive data set of all the turkey and chicken farms sure. in North Carolina, most of which happen to be in Duplin and you know Robeson and, and those other counties, and um, it it they're also have, you know monitoring the waste that's going in that's been untreated. So it's it's not just the pork; it's the you know um, the fowl, you know the, the turkeys and the chickens that we're putting on our tables as well. But it goes back to what you're saying about know the source of, of what you're buying, and that that's very difficult, I think, for the average consumer, and I think it. It, that's a big hurdle we're we're having to um you know overcome at this point as consumer yeah, it, is. You know. it is i mean you know I, the, of course as a lawyer i look at any industry and think you know it's foolhardy to expect that consumers are the are the ones that should be regulating an industry 
I mean, regulators exist for that purpose. And, and we, we, we ought to simply have a regulatory regime that honors the humans in the environment and that, for, that forces these companies to include in their you know, cost estimates um, the actual human and environmental cost of their business model. But all too often because of you know, political gamesmanship um, you know, and the protectionist kind of regula regulations and regulatory regimes, or even just the anti-regulatory attitudes of politicians, what we end up with is fairly toothless tiger in the regulator. And, and very often the regulators want jobs in the, the industries they regulate. And so the revolving door, you know, uh, produces a, a legal regime that doesn't hold these industries accountable and that keeps consumers in the dark. So, and I see this, you know, this is, it's not uniquely American, but, you know, I, I've done work overseas. And one thing that I would say is, is that um, even China, which of course the Chinese own Smithfield now, uh, but even China will not use lagoons and spray fields uh, in, its, in its pork production. So they, there's, there was actually a big article in Rolling Stone magazine in which uh, the, you know, the, the journalist hypothesized that China was using North Carolina like the developing world. Right. Uh, mm. Which is true. Yeah, that was a great part of your book that really opened my eyes. I mean, you know, it's not like the Chinese are the uh, friends of the environment in general, but the fact that they're actually doing a better job at cleaning up their hog waste than we are in North Carolina, that was just like beyond belief. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Depressing. I mean, yeah. having been to the, the state house and talked to the folks and, uh, you know, in the legislature, you've been trying to work on this for a long time. You know, it's it it is difficult. Um, it is a difficult political environment in North Carolina. I, yeah, yeah I sympathize yeah. with you all. Yeah, <laughs> Virginia is a little better. I mean, we've we've come a long way. I mean, we used to be just as hidebound, but um, we've made some strides. And you know, politics is always dirty and messy, but um, you know, it's it's particularly so these days in North Carolina for reasons that you know are kind of partisan and we don't need to get into. But you you probably know. <laughs> Hmm. So I want to, um, I saw before we got into that, that Terry, you had a part two to your question. So I just want to respect the order in which they're being asked. And then we can um, jump to Billy and June and Gail. Um, am I correct that other than the, the original plaintiffs, now under the right to farm bill, nobody else can bring any kind of suit against um the pork and they can bring it against other farms, but not pork, right? Uh, actually, all agricultural um, operations were included in the redefinition of nuisance. Um, so, yeah, they were actually trying to, you know, protect uh, the chicken farmers and the turkey farmers and and I really the industries behind them um, just as much as they were trying to protect Smithfield. Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's not not to say that there could never be a suit. Um, but they did a darn good job of creating the kind of gauntlet that you pretty much can't survive. Um, it would take a really unique legacy claim um, that somehow was not involved in the, uh, the big North Carolina nuisance lawsuits. Um, I don't see that kind of claim existing out there. Um, and, you know, so yeah, they, they, they basically effectively foreclosed future suits. And meanwhile, you know, a lot of people have asked questions about other states because, of course, there are a lot of states that have hog farms. And, and in fact, North Carolina is now third uh, on the list of, of hog producing states behind Iowa and Minnesota of all states. Mm -hmm. And there are people in those states that would love to, to you know, succeed in a lawsuit. Um, unfortunately, you know, at the very same time that North Carolina was litigating the industry in those states uh, went to their legislatures and did exactly what North Carolina did just a little bit too late. So now, you know, we've got a, a gauntlet that's nationwide. And really, you know, the solution here um, from a legislative standpoint is Cory Booker's bill, the Farm System Reform Act, um, which would uh, actually, you know, federalize a lot of these regulations and, and you know, set up a, a whole fund to buy back, um, you know, these farms to get them, especially the biggest ones, out of operation while not bankrupt bankrupting the farmers, uh, many of whom are sharecroppers these days. They're, all of their profit is going to the big company, 
And, you know, the, the one, one farmer who testified at the very beginning, the first trial, he said he had 15, he had, he had 15,000 pigs on his hog farm and he made so little money from it that he could only pay his life insurance and, and his truck. He couldn't even pay himself a salary, 15,000 hmm. hogs. You can't, I mean, you can't even believe that. Like, how is it that the economics are that imbalanced? And yet they are these days. They weren't in the beginning, but they are today. Thank you. Wow. Our next person was Billy. Yeah, thanks, Anisha. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, I completely agree this book was phenomenal. Um, it read just like a novel. And that's something that a few of us had talked about. Um, it made it to the top of my gift giving list this year <laughs> during the holiday season. Um, but it was interesting. Uh, I was actually talking with someone from Eastern North Carolina who had lived through this throughout her childhood. Um, and we ended up talking about the book and everything that I learned in this new take on it that she had never heard about. And she actually went back home and was talking to her family about it. And they kind of had this new perspective from civil rights per lens to the issue, um, for, themselves and the other residents, but then also for the farmers who, as you just mentioned, are being really taken advantage of by the system. Um, but that kind of, we talked very briefly about the political side. And there was one quote in the book that really kind of stuck with me. Um, and it was, uh, there's this theme throughout that the people in power really matter. The people that we elect really matter. The, the lawyers matter, all of these individuals. Um, and it, you said it um, was a single night with a single vote. And that stuck with me so much because as we are going through the gerrymandering cases and as um, we have a lot going on within our political system in North Carolina, as the author, when this was published, what was your hope um, for readers to do with your book so that it didn't come down to a single night, a single vote in that capacity, because it was ultimately a lot of individual decisions that led to that being the case. Yeah, you know, um, I, I've been writing stories about big issues, uh, you know, uh, human rights and civil rights issues for a long time. And, you know, I started out uh, as a young, uh, young author thinking that, you know, I'm going to take on the world and, you know, and write <laughs> stories that, in and of themselves are going to change the conversation. I've, I've come down off of that high horse and, and recognize that the very best that I can do is, is offer the world truth through story, which I think is you know maybe the most powerful form of commu human communication that exists. I mean, it really does transcend all the barriers that divide us and bring us together in a, a new, unique way. And, it, and stories can foster empathy. They can create understanding that didn't exist before. That's my goal. My goal is ultimately to, you know, use the story form to change the human heart, you know, one, one person at a time. And then what people do with it, I mean, I, you know, what's cool is that empathy is the seedbed of all meaningful action in the world and activism, um, you know, because we act out of that, that desire to better the world um, for ourselves, for our kids, but also for our neighbors and our loved ones, for you know, even strangers. You know, there's always something that can be done. Um, you know, but at this, as you point out, and as I mentioned before, I mean, there are some structural barriers to, you know, getting an industry that has billions of dollars uh, and basically owns the legislature to change, uh, you know, the way it does business. And that that is something that the longer I live and, and the more industries that I spotlight through my stories, the more troubled I am by the way that our country has basically given the levers of power over to you know, these moneyed interests. Um, and, and, you know, we've ceded our freedom. I mean, that's like, this really should be a, a matter of, you know, we all have the right to clean air and clean water. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what your skin color is, your ethnicity, your, you know, bank account. We all have those rights. So how in the world is it that our politicians can allow an industry to despoil the air and the water 
and even make people sick. And this is, you know, this is just one industry among many, many, many industries that are protected by politicians who they aren't doing anything obviously illegal. It's just that our system allows them to act in the interest of these giant corporations instead of in the interest of their, you know, their people. And, and so my, my hope, you know, obviously as a storyteller is to shine a light on something people want to keep hidden and hope that, you know, the folks who read it though, and, you know, if I'm successful in bringing this to the screen, that the folks who see it, you know, take another look uh, as consumers at, you know, the pork they buy, in this case with Wastelands, um, we, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't ever want to eat pork again. And it's funny. I mean, every, all the plaintiffs that I know eat pork. I do. I mean, not a lot, but I love bacon. I mean, there aren't that many Americans who aren't vegetarians or vegans. You don't love bacon. And yet we, you can buy bacon that doesn't come from, you know, this kind of industrialized hog farm. You can buy, you just have to spend a little bit more money. Maybe you eat less of it. It doesn't matter. I mean, ultimately we can make conscientious decisions as consumers. And we also can call our politicians and let them know that we're really disgusted when we see that they're, you know, acting in the best interest of these big corporations instead of, you know, the small people that they are supposed to be representing. And, and of course, you know, the last sort of shout out to groups like yours, I mean, uh, you know, collective action is, is as American as apple pie. And frankly, it's the thing, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville talked about it. I mean, it's, it's one of the great things about America. We organize, um, and you know, the more organized we are in pushing back, the more effective we are. So, um, plaudits to you guys for, you know, starting something and, and, uh, gathering some steam and momentum. Thank you so much. And the story definitely, um, did seed those um, empathetic conversations. Awesome, thank you. Um, Anisha, I'll go next, I guess. Um, so Corbin, I'm June Blotnick. I'm the former director of Clean Air NC, just retired last uh, fall. And um, just wanna thank you for being part of this conversation and for writing a terrific book. Um, I just wanted to bring up, you know, um, we um, give out annual airkeeper awards every year to people making a difference. And um, in 2017, we gave an airkeeper award to Devon Hall and Reach. Great. Um, yeah, down in Dublin County. And the day after that was our annual NC Breathe Conference. And we held it in Raleigh to be near the legislators. And um, we were giving awards to two other legislators. And right around when we were giving those awards or right afterwards, I saw Devon and his whole team get up and like move really fast out of the room and come to find out that was uh, one of the days, probably many days where, um, you know, Jimmy Dixon was doing his thing across the street. And um, so they had heard something, they got the call, whether it was from Mona or somebody else um, to get over there. And, you know, it was just reading that chapter about, you know, that whole month of March and April in 2017, it just, brought it all back to me. We weren't super involved in CAFOs at that time, but we wanted to hold them up. Um, and then, you know, the last few years gotten much more involved, but you really did paint such a powerful picture of injustice. And for those of us and um, who were around, you know, during Thank those you. days, it, it really, um, you know, brings up the feelings of anxiety, you know, on Devon's face and the urgency to get, you know, get over there, what's going on now, you know, it's like living in a continual crisis world, these families. Um, but um, I really wanted to thank you and I really hope it, it does um, make it into the movies because what you've done now is given a national voice, right? Um, whereas before we didn't have that. So thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I'm glad it resonated with you. I, um, I really enjoyed writing about that sequence. It was it just impossible to believe that it happened. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, it made for fantastic storytelling. I had that, uh, that thought many times along the way that I really could not have crafted a more compelling story had I written it as fiction, which is 
kind of rare. I mean, life doesn't typically work out this way. So I was very privileged uh, to be able to tell tell the story. There was just so much great <laughs> fodder for scenes and characters. And I mean, so many of the characters, they, in fact, they even would tell me, like Mike Kesky would often say, you know, look, just look at this motley crew. I mean, we're just all caricatures. I mean, you you can just you can you can do whatever you want with us, you know, and then people are gonna like reading about it. And I, I said, Yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, the not a single person is uh in the story, you know, is is sort of straight out of central casting, which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know if they cast um you know, Matthew McConaughey is Daniel Wallace. My wife will come to see the movie. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I have a follow-up question since we're on the topic of storytelling at large. Could you describe your views of storytelling as a tool in helping enact change? And do you have any comments on how, how it could be used not only in this situation, but across society to inspire change? Yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting because in the law, I've had this conversation with lawyers. Um, you know, lawyers very often like to talk in, in sort of this factualistic, you know, very sort of journalistic style. Um, and especially in the courtroom, they think, well, you know, if I just if I just give the jury enough facts and and my and my feeling is actually in all spheres, whether it's, you know, a courtroom or uh, you know, the court of public opinion, a story is always the most uh, effective way of, of engaging the whole person. I mean, you can engage someone mentally, intellectually, uh, you know, with, with facts and figures, with statistics, especially if they're visual. And, and sometimes there's a place for that. It's not that there isn't a place for that. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, like, unless you can appeal to the human heart, it's going to be really hard to convince people to, you know, consider changing their mind, um, consider living differently. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're, when you're bringing, you know, challenging subjects to people and asking them to rethink their own behaviors, yeah. they need to somehow connect with other humans. They need to understand that this matters more than just, hey, you know, you are telling me that what I am doing is bad. Like that's, that's never an easy sell. Um, but, but instead, if you can, if you can tell a story and and make people understand that actually this subject you care about is affecting real people and here's you know somebody who could be your neighbor or could be your your friend or your family member even um all of a sudden it changes like our hearts just open up and and even i mean i've seen this happen with uh you know even people who really come in with an attitude like you tell a story instead of, you know, just making an argument, which very often just raises people's hackles. If you tell a story, you know, it just breaks down. It almost like kind of sneakily gets by all of those objections that we all have in our minds, um, you know, to, to subjects or to arguments that we naturally, you know, dislike. Um, it's hard. It's like, it's like homelessness. I mean, you know, I, I don't know, like, you know, that's one of the thorniest subjects on earth, but every time I walk by somebody in Charlottesville, there are a lot of folks that are here, you know, that, that don't have homes and, you know, and their hands are out. I mean, my, my heart always goes out to them in a way that it simply wouldn't if somebody were just, you know, there was just a sign donate here to help the homeless, right? Um, you know, you put a human face on anything, even if you don't know their story, um, it, it means so much more. But then if you do know your, their story, then ultimately, you know, it's much harder to turn away. It's much harder to just go back and do what you were doing before. That's the power of story. It kind of leaves you with this open-ended question, like, what kind of person are you? You know, and all of us, it's good to, it's good to be asked that question. I, it, it's, it's hard, but it's really good to be asked that question. Thank you for being, telling this story. And I'm gonna ask, I guess what's kind of like the million dollar question, but beyond getting people to care and gaining their empathy through storytelling, what are ways that we, and, and solutions and actions that we can do as North Killinians to come together to hold the industry accountable um, and to for this ongoing damage and violence against BIPOC communities? And I know this is not something that one person can answer, but can you please provide your perspective? Yeah, look, I mean, um... There are folks like uh, Rick Dove, Larry Baldwin, uh, and the Waterkeepers Alliance, Devon Hall, um, 
a neat Naima Mohammed from NCEJN. Um, you know, they're folks who have a lot of institutional knowledge and are, are pressing uh, what buttons there are in in North Carolina. And, and really, you know, as as I always encourage folks, especially young people, to you know find those wise ones, you know, who've been around a while and who still believe that change is possible, and all those people that I mentioned do. And, and learn from them, connect with them, um, you know, find ways to associate. If you've got an organization, which you all do, you know, you can uh, collaborate together and, and just find ways to, you know, look what's going on. What, I mean, it, whenever there's an occasion, whenever there's an opportunity, um, make sure that you're there, that you're present, that your voice is heard. Um, you know, even politicians in, in the North Carolina legislature, they actually do have to listen to their constituents. And, you know, they, unlike the industry, which can insulate itself with just a mountain of kind of BS over the course of time, you know, politicians do have to answer their phones um, and they do have to answer, you know, every couple of years at the ballot box and, and things can change. I mean, unfortunately, with this kind of money, this kind of power, and the kind of you know weird political gamesmanship that's going on with gerrymandering, you know, you're talking about generational change, and and we've got to, you know, I, I think when I look back at the early civil rights activists, um, I, I they they recognize this, they and and I mean really they recognized it. Looking back at many other peaceful nonviolent movements um, for you know significant change, that it's generational. You, you got to change people's mindsets across time. And it's sometimes, I mean, sad to say it, but sometimes the old guard kind of has to die, uh, you know, from natural causes, but they, they kind of, you know, they have to, to move out of the way and, and with them goes, you know, their sort of hidebound thinking. So I, you know, I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that young people these days, I see it in my own kids, you know, are naturally um, inclined to consider the justice elements of questions they're not just, you know, they don't just think in terms of what's best for me. We all have that tendency, but at least, you know, young people are thinking outside the box. So I'm hopeful that over the course of time, we can see change. Um, Smithfield promised, you know, in, in an agreement with the attorney general 20 years ago to, you know, phase out the lagoons and spray fields. They were going to study it uh, and they were going to develop a technology and then they were going to deploy the technology. They found ways, as, as industry does, to torpedo their own process so that they, you know, while they found the technology, they never had, had to implement it. But you know what? I mean, that agreement still exists, and I'm a lawyer, and I would love to see some attorney general in yeah. the next few cycles take a look at the Smithfield Agreement again and say, guess what, guys? Hey, this piece of paper, it's not dead. Like, you signed it. We've got the technology um, yep. you know, we need to actually revisit this. So that is something that can be done. Um, also support at the national level, uh, Cory Booker and his efforts. Um, my understanding is that the new farm bill, I mean, we've obviously got challenges with the House of Representatives uh, in Congress, but there is, a, you know, every farm, every farm bill eventually passes. And the question is what's in it. Mm -hmm. And I know Cory would really like to get some pieces of his Farm System Reform Act included in the, the 2023 farm bill. So that's something to pay attention to mm -hmm. and perhaps advocate uh, for if he, if he manages to get some amendments passed. Thank you. So, I see someone has their hand raised, so I'm gonna let them go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tracy. And um, I just wanna say this book was a really emotional read for me. Um, I followed this issue for, over 20 years, I um, moved to Wayne County in the 90s, uh, went to Carolina and got my environmental sciences and engineering degree. Uh, so, you know, knew Steve Wing um, and worked with, or, or, you know, worked with Rick Dove and some others and have been trying to bring advocacy to this issue for two decades. <laughs> um, and, you know, as emotional as the as the trials were themselves, like, I just felt like your book does a really great job of sort of condensing that in such a great way that is, you know, people can connect to and, and sort of pass the story on. Um, so thank you uh, for that. 
Um, one thought or question that I've had, I, I noticed, I think it was maybe before the, the, after the end of the second trial or towards, you know, uh, the end, um, Smithfield began instituting some changes, uh, for the neighbors, you know, using the refrigerated dead boxes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know, if, I can't remember if it, uh, they began instituting, uh, the biogas, but I know they already have the, the agreement now with Duke Energy, um, to, you know, essentially move farms, uh, capos in this direction of just covering these lagoons um, and converting the, the biogas into energy, which just nets them even more millions, bands of dollars. Um, and I guess the question is, I know that uh, like in CEJN and some other advocacy groups, you know, the, the community still have concerns over this new technology about the, the safety of it. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, just sort of having like large quantities of gas trapped underneath the cover <laughs> and uh, uh, the issues that, you know, North Carolina has had with uh, frequent intense hurricanes that have flooded these areas. It, you know, the lagoon spray, the lagoon problem hasn't been erased and won't be erased by that. So I'm just curious if that's something that you, you know, ran into, uh, talked with folks about, if it's something that kind of came up in your in your research and in your interviews or, or kind of maybe what you see ahead for that. Yeah, I mean, look, Smithfield, um, you know, tried to, to deny that uh, lagoons were a problem until they could actually make money off of the gases that were coming out. <laughs> it's just, just, just the classic kind of industry move. So yeah, uh, they are planning, they're deploying these these caps and their lagoons slowly, but, you know, uh, as they develop the infrastructure, obviously, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't ultimately alleviate the, the problem of having to pump uh, and, and spray. And I mean, the, the challenge, of course, is that you can capture, you know, while you can capture the methane and convert it to energy, that the hogs are still doing their business and the methane isn't the only waste. So you've still got to spray, you're not going to eliminate uh you know that problem with the neighbors you're not you're not going to uh fix the fact that a lot of these lagoons were built for you know 30 years and it's been 30 years in a lot of cases and so you know the kind of unspoken danger that nobody wants to deal with is the fact that a lot of these lagoons the linings um if they have linings in some cases just a clay lining are breaking down and so you're you're having these you know highly toxic uh, chemicals leaching into the groundwater, and you just you just don't want to have to deal with that with thousands of these things across eastern North Carolina and the floodplains. Um, so yeah, it's it's um it's it's interesting how you know the industry can turn that to its advantage and say you know hey we're going to cover our lagoons oh yeah we're going to harvest the methane and make millions of dollars with Duke helping but we're going to cover the lagoons but then. You know, then they just don't want to deal with the fact that, well, I mean, okay, but are you going to depopulate the farms? Because if you don't, then you're still going to have all of that, you know, urine and feces running into a, a fixed, uh, you know, a size cesspool, and you're still going to have to pump it out into the neighborhoods. I mean, it isn't, how is it any different? Like you're not, you're not actually, you might be fixing one aspect of the odor problem, but it's, it is just one aspect of, of many aspects. And until they're willing to deal with the fact that they've got, you know, an untold, tr like a trillion gallons of this highly toxic hog waste that they've actually got to figure out how to process, you know, they're going to, they're going to just be pushing it around, you know, sort of rearranging <laughs> the chess pieces instead of dealing with the board. And that's, you know, that that's typical of industry, but um, I will say on a personal note, I'm so glad that you enjoyed the book. And I uh, I regretted that I didn't get to meet Steve Wayne before he passed. I did to spend quite a bit of time with his wife, Betsy, and get to I got to meet his, his daughters um, and his best friend. And, you know, what a guy. And I'm actually going to be delivering the annual uh, memorial, Steve Wayne Memorial Lecture at UNC Chapel Hill next month. So I'm excited to get to honor his legacy there. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm looking at the clock and I've, I've actually got to run here um, quickly, but I, I hate to cut anybody off who has like a, a question they didn't get to ask that is just absolutely burning inside of them. So if we could wrap up here quickly, um, that'd be great. But, you know, I don't want to cut anybody off. 
Yeah, it looks like we have one more question. If Perfect. Uh, I did know you had a social time. I just, I was thinking that this is like a super fun site cleanup moment. I mean, there are companies like Geosyntech out there that actually go out and they can, they do risk analysis. They do a whole environmental analysis of a, of the situations like these massive uh, agribusiness hog farms. I mean, has there been talk of using super fund money to help clean up any of this? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a very good question. You know, I, I'm as a storyteller, I obviously, you know, had a, a kind of contained time frame uh, that I was working with in bringing the story to life. And I've, I've gotten, obviously, as I've been talking about it, I've been informed about, you know, new developments since uh, the story closed, at least the story I told. Um, but I'm not aware of, of that. I would love to see it happen. I mean, it, look, there's I, I think uh, one thing that I, if I learned anything from from uh, writing this book, it's that uh, there is a tremendous amount of human ingenuity out there to solve problems like this. And it really does just take getting the right people together and finding a way to fund it. Uh, I mean, Tom Butler, who's a hero of mine, he's the hog farmer who testified in all five trials at great exposure to himself and who's mm -hmm. basically spent every dollar he could you know, beg and and borrow uh, and, you know, what, what he had personally in order yeah. to, you know, uh, solve the problem on his own hog farm while continuing to run it. Uh, right. And, you know, so I, I just, Tom is, is just a great example of, yeah, you know what, if you've got the will and you, you find, you know, the right group of people, you can get a lot of cool stuff done. So I'm, look, I'm hopeful. I'm an optimist. I don't look at this you know, even though it's been a generation and, and, you know, the changes have been modest, the industry is enormously powerful, has a lot of money. I don't look at it, you know, and say, you know, all hope is lost by any means. I, I do think, though, that the future is, is going to require new ingenuity, new technology, young blood and, and a lot of patience um, and pushing the right buttons over the course of time to, yeah. uh, to affect change. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's where a movie comes in handy because that'll really get the message out. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I used to help well, people. Thank you so much. Write screenplays, so I know. <laughs> oh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It looks like Larry's got his hand up, wants to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Corbin. I just wanted hey, to say, hey, good. I know you got to run, but just wanted to say, hey, it's good to see you. Good to see this many people uh, interested in what's going on with the book. So before you ran off, I just wanted to say, hey, and sorry, Absolutely. Rick, Rick is sorry he couldn't be here tonight. He's got some things going on with his wife. Sure, sure. No, I understand. But thanks for showing up. Look, I mean, just in closing, I, I just want to say thanks to everybody, you know, for coming out, for uh, for reading the book. If you haven't, uh, I hope you will and enjoy it. Um, please reach out to me via my, my uh, website. I always respond quickly if you've got any questions or follow ups. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to do this. And if there are other events that, you know, <clears throat> you want to let me know about, I mean, I'm, I'm down in North Carolina <clears throat> off and on, um, and plan to continue to be. So, uh, you know, I, I certainly won't be a stranger. Just, uh, keep me apprised of anything you think that I should know. Thank you, Corbin. Thanks, Absolutely. Corbin. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. You all take Thank care. You. Have a great evening. Thank you. you.